The Saudi Pro League is set to become one of the top 10 leagues in the world. Sounds out of the world, right? Well, I don't think so. The signs say it is possible, the plans predict so, and some huge funds are already clearing the path for its actualization. All these are possible thanks to the efforts of one man, Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS as he's popularly known. You see, MBS is the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and de facto ruler of the kingdom. So essentially, he runs the day-to-day -day affairs of the kingdom, including how they manage the heavy inflow of cash that comes from their vast reservoir of liquid gold oil. Now, MBS is known to have some really interesting fantasies, or would I say, visions for the kingdom that would one day be his to manage. And one such is to build the barren but oil-rich desert into a football and generally a sports hub by 2030. Ambitious, huh? Well, before you write this off as a pipe dream, the Desert Prince has some pretty good solid groundwork in place that is worth looking at. But what are these big plans? And can these grand schemes catapult Saudi football and even the Saudi Pro League to destination 2030? From huge investment funds to infrastructural plans to landing football heavyweights and a watertight long-term roadmap, stick around to the end of this video as we navigate the intriguing journey to the future of the Saudi Pro League. In 2021, Saudi-backed public investment fund, also known as the PIF, launched into the city of Newcastle in England with one goal in mind, to land the struggling local club into its sports portfolio. It was an ambitious move, one that was met with some resistance. So days turned to weeks and it seemed the deal would stall at some point. Although a section of the fans was okay with the selling off of the struggling club, others felt selling to the oil-rich Saudis was a great evil, considering their track record with human rights violations. Eventually, after all the pushes and shoves, the deal was pulled through. Newcastle United became a pioneer in something maybe bigger than what the fans and board ever imagined. By the end of 2022, after some infusion of cash and the much needed facelift, a once mediocre Newcastle United, yes, mediocre, after the glory days of Alan Shearer with just a few sparsely spread brilliant performances. Anyway, a once mediocre Newcastle now booked a place at the big table. They qualified for Champions League football for the next season. Here's the thing, purchasing Newcastle United was a testing ground for Saudi Arabia. A foretaste, if you like, of something huge to come. And from the look of things, this test worked perfectly. In December 2022, just some days after the World Cup, Saudi was in the headlines again. This time, one of its elite clubs, Al Nasir, signed one of the greatest players of all time, Cristiano Ronaldo. The news was met with mixed reactions across the football community. There were claims of it being the player's retirement home and the ever-present shadow that has followed any major sports spending coming from the Desert Kingdom, the accusations of sports washing. But something was different this time. The Kingdom, through its money bag, the PIF, was on a huge experiment and everything was working according to plan. In June 2023, the PIF announced that they would sink an eye-watering $2.3 billion into football sponsorships. While this move didn't really attract the fanfare and the noise of the previous moves, it got them somewhere closer to launching their end game. The stratospheric amount, which was more or less a drop in the ocean when compared to the PIF's $600 million arsenal, had bought them a majority stake in the four of the Saudi Pro League's top clubs, Al Halal, Al Lafid, Al Nasir, and Al Alal, all now had the much needed wins on their sale and the momentum to launch the next move. What was the next move? To make Saudi Arabia's home league the standard. The goal was to pump in the necessary funds to make the Saudi Pro League attractive to foreign talent and eventually build one of the top 10 football destinations in the world. So how did this play out? Once the European transfer markets opened, these Saudi clubs were all over Europe, dollar-stuffed briefcases in hand, bidding for top European talents at ridiculous prices. This surely got the attention of the players and the message was as clear as day. There's money to make in the Desert League, so sign with us. With this, Chelsea found the perfect place to ship the unwanted part of their bloated squad. From Edouard Mendy to Kaladao Kolobali to Hakim Zayek and N'Gol Kante, all roads led to the Saudi Pro League. The Chelsea mass exodus was just the beginning of what was to come afterward because what came was the wave of players who were aging, surplus to requirement, and the free agents. One such was Liverpool's Roberto Firmino. Then you have others like Karim Benzema, Marcelo Brozovic, Alex Tellis, Siko Fufina, 
Jordan Henderson, Jota, Alan St. Maxman, etc. These clubs made an impressive roster poaching top European talents with multi-million dollar offers. Prior to the onslaught of the European transfer market, the Saudi Arabian Football Federation made a significant adjustment that set the tone for what was to come. The body raised the number of top players per Saudi club to eight, including elite or marquee players. Now, while this move opened them to more foreign talent, it plugged the leak to the possibility of flooding the league with foreign talent. This was a much needed PR. So at the beginning, it might appear as a retirement league for aging out of contract players. However, the end game for getting these popular but aging talents is one thing and one thing alone, advertising. The kingdom is building interest in the league for their largely young and inexperienced talent. As it is now, the future is sure for Saudi's young players. Even though they would have to put up with the superstars for now, it's only a necessary evil to help achieve the kingdom's football dreams. However, it seems we are missing something here. Now, I know all the red carpet, big names, and top talents attract the needed PR to the league, but well, what about the infrastructure? Because you see, such an expansion must go side by side with a strong drive for infrastructure. In February this year, the Asian Football Confederation, for the first time in its history, confirmed the Saudi Arabia Football Federation, SAFF, as the host of the 2027 AFC Asian Cup. Now, this is well-deserved considering the fact that Saudi Arabia has clinched the coveted Asian jewel thrice. Nevertheless, as part of hosting the 2023 Mundial, the kingdom has set its sights on adding 10 new stadiums and some serious touch-up on its existing sports facilities. So securing the hosting rights plays directly into the long-term plans of making the kingdom one of the top 10 football destinations. But with the infrastructure pretty much covered for now, there has to be some serious long-term blueprints to pull off something as huge as the Project 2030. What is the end game? How does the kingdom, and most importantly the man whose prints are unmistakable in the whole drive towards football dominance, MBS, plan to get this job done? Recently, the interim CEO of the Saudi Pro League took to the media to reveal the league's end game and blueprint in the long run. This included a solid four-point plan to land the three-pronged expression of the grand plan. This includes increasing club competitiveness, creating long-term growth in the sports sector, and becoming a global player in the football world. According to the CEO, the Saudi Pro League has an incredible opportunity to help fulfill the country's football ambitions and inspire more of its population to get into sports. The Saudi Pro League, SPL, will take a central elevated role in supporting and developing clubs. So what are the nuts and bolts of this giant stride that would move the kingdom up the ladder to a place of prominence in world football? Join me as we journey through the four cardinal points that will shape the future of the Saudi Pro League. You see, the plan has been long coming with some serious homework, especially on the Saudi population and the way they relate with sports, football in particular. I mean, how do you build a top league without fans? You know, the homegrown support that keeps the ball rolling? In 2022, the Saudi press agency revealed that the drive towards building a strong football culture was already yielding incredible results. Over 80% of the Saudi now played, attended, or planned to follow football. The figures for mass participation in sports also reached new highs. While in 2015, only a meager 13% of the population participated in sports. By 2022, the number had more than quadrupled. 50% of the population now participated in sports. So with Saudi's young population on the rise, this big win meant one thing, a huge supply of a young talent eager to kick the round leather. And this plays perfectly into the first cardinal point of their drive to football dominance, supporting young talent. And with this largely successful, the SPL's interim CEO announced that from the next season, the SPL will become younger and more competitive, taking advantage of the groundwork the Saudi Arabian Football Federation has been putting in at the grassroots for many years. This comes with a well laid out plan to drop the age limit for club sides from 18 to 16 and some policies to follow it up. By the 2025-26 season, 10 out of 35 squad members must be under 21 years old. There will also be a quota system that requires clubs to have a certain number of homegrown players on their roster. Now, when the SPL added Michael Eminello, ex-Nigerian international and superstar sporting director responsible for some amazing work in building both Chelsea and AS Monaco, it hardly even made the news. But he has been the guy behind the scenes in the recent hunt for European talent through the Player Acquisition Center of Excellence program, otherwise known as the PACE program, which is the second cardinal point of the SPL's vision. 
So essentially, this Eminello guy is the sporting director of the whole league. He's also the brain behind their foreign player acquisition. So he walks each club through the intricacies of scouting and landing talent, which includes squad mapping, player care, budget allocations, negotiations, and transactions. And the end game for the PACE program is to connect the young Saudi talent with the right international talent and role models. Now, football is not all about the passion, the goals, and the shiny silverware. It is an investment, and every good investor wants some returns. So for the Saudi project to be successful, the clubs have to be commercially viable and successful. This brings us to the third cardinal point of the SPL's drive to football dominance, the club development framework. This move has been in the works for years, and the SPL has pretty much done its homework by gathering a ton of global football expertise on maximizing its huge investments in sports. So, if you're one of those who think the whole move for top talent is just a way to spend some loose oil money, now is the time for a serious rethink. Because according to SPL interim CEO, this strategy goes far beyond and much deeper than the player transfers that are dominating headlines and focuses just as much on what happens off the pitch at the clubs. We are looking to the long term and will be judged on that, especially with helping the clubs become commercially successful with robust business models. The club development program will also activate the fair play financial system and monitor compliance with local and Asian licensing standards. Meanwhile, in 2021, the SAFF shelled out billions of dollars to launch a program, the name Tactics for Tomorrow. The goal of this program was pretty much straightforward, to nurture the next generation of football talents and coaches to manage them. This forms the fourth and last cardinal point of the Saudi game plan. With the launch of this program, funding for youth football in the kingdom soared by 162%, and this has yielded some really great results, such as establishing 23 regional training centers for both the players and coaches, as well as a whopping rise in enrollment. In fact, the number of players enrolled in the program shot up by 58%, and for the coaches, from a meager 750 in 2018 to over 5,500 now. Interestingly, despite allegations around the kingdom's treatment of its female population, over 1,000 female coaches make up the total student population. So, in the end, it may look like the Saudi Pro League is on a cash-spending spree like others that have come before it, such as the MLS and the Chinese Super League. However, when you peel off the veneer, beneath the exterior is a well-laid, intricate, and calculated plan to dominate world football. So, it won't be out of place to say, welcome to the new era, the era of Saudi football.